So, this is the fourth and last session of this short course. So, today I'd like uh, to introduce uh, three applications, non trivial applications of uh, the results I presented in the previous lectures. And this actually corresponds to, to three lectures, three, three different lectures, all of them today. So, I'd not be able to give uh, much detail on this, but at least uh, statements and some ideas. So it's, uh, say, lectures four, five, and six. So this, uh, the fourth one is uh, an application uh, to the nodal set, which uh, in this case will be lines, will be one-dimensional, of some Schrodinger operator on Euclidean space. Uh, specifically, the, quant the, the operator which is known in physics as the quantum harmonic oscillator. Second application is on a nodal sets, compact a nodal sets of a Lenkan equation, which is a nonlinear PD. And the last uh, application is on a nodal set of uh, eigenfunctions on a compact manifold, uh, on the torus. So nodal sets. Functions on the torus. So, in, in all these three contexts, the strategy that I explained in the second lecture, the second part, mainly the global approximation <coughs> theorem, breaks. You cannot apply it because, well, either because uh, <coughs> uh, your equation is non linear, and this uh, global approximation theorem only works for linear PDEs, more general than the Hempworth equation, but still you need linearity. Or because uh, you are in a compact manifold, the torus, so it's uh, Rn with periodic uh, boundary conditions. So in compact manifolds, the global approximation theorem doesn't work. Remember one of the conditions on the global approximation theorem. The complement, actually, it's, uh, the, the important condition is that the complement, the complement must be unbounded. I stated it as connected because I was thinking of always of Euclidean space. But uh, if you are in a, in general, in a full generality, what you need is uh, that the complement be unbounded. All, all the components of the complement be unbounded. And of course, you can't have thus this in, in a compact manifold. The complement of any compact set is one. So you cannot apply the global approximation theorem here. You need a different idea. And the same uh, here, in this case, we are in Euclidean space, but the solutions that we want have decay, uh, and they, are, they should be in R2. Uh, in physics, they are interested in square integrable functions. And so your global approximation theorems don't give, uh, don't, don't give uh, square integrable functions. You don't have enough decay with these theorems. So you need uh, other ideas. I, I use the, the theorem that I proved uh, on the realization of nodal sets for the Henkel equation, but you need more. So let's start with this, with the quantum harmonic oscillator, just to show, the, to show you the kind of theorems that we can prove and the idea, the extra idea that you need to complement previous ideas so that you can prove uh, the result. So the quantum harmonic oscillator. So, in quantum mechanics, in classical mechanics, quantum harmoni uh, classical harmonic oscillator is just uh, defined by a function, a Hamiltonian, which, uh, which defines uh, an ODE, a system of ODEs, of ordinary differential equation. So, in quantum mechanics, quantum harmonic oscillator is a spectral problem. So, it's an operator, it's this operator, minus Laplacian, plus x squared, so x is the position, so this is just 
uh, square of distance uh, to the origin. This is the, the, the potential, the harmonic oscillator potential, x squared. It's an eigenvalue problem, so the eigenfunction psi, the operator acting on psi, should be proportional to psi. And we want uh, these uh, solutions to be a square integrable, actually, in H2. Our space now is R3, three-dimensional. And uh, we want these functions to be complex-valued. So in, in physics in general, you consider complex-valued uh, wave functions. So this problem here can, is uh, completely understood in the sense that you can compute the spectrum, the whole spectrum of these eigenvalues, and also you can compute uh, an orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions in terms uh, of uh, some polynomials and also some Gaussian functions, etc. So, uh, in particular, the spectrum is given by all integers of this form, 2n plus 3, n is any non-negative integer. This is the spectrum. This operator is essentially self-adjoint in this space. This defines a very nice spectral problem in this space. And you can compute the spectrum. And each eigenvalue is not simple. The eigenvalues have multiplicity. The dimension of the eigenspace uh, is not one, it's bigger. And actually, it grows with n. It's bigger and bigger as n tends to infinity. The multiplicity of these eigenfunctions multiplicity, depending on n, it's, uh, it grows quadratically with n. Okay. So, um, I, I'm going to analyze the nodal sets of these objects, of these eigenfunctions. So the nodal set, so this C is a complex valued function, so it has real and imaginary part. C1 plus I, C2. So if you look at the zero set of the complex valued function, this must be the, is the intersection, the intersection of the zero set of the, of the real part and of the imaginary part. So it's the intersection of surfaces. <coughs> So this is typically dimension two. dimension 2, this is dimension 2, two. so what you get, this is simply the modal set of the eigenfunction, the complex value of the eigenfunction, so typically the nodal set of, the comp of a complex value eigenfunction consists of intersection of surfaces, so it's lines, it consists, it's one dimension. One. So you have um, the surface, one of the surfaces, for example, the zero set of the first of the, of the real part, and you also have a second zero set, the zero set of the, of the second again function of the second of the imaginary part. Okay. And you intersect these surfaces, so you get something which is one-dimensional. And this is actually uh, the nodal set, part, a piece of the nodal set of, of this C. So it's actually, we can, we can call it the uh, nodal line. So this is what we want to study. So in this case, uh, so when we analyze the, the nodal sets of the of the Helmholtz equation, we uh, we thought of surfaces. So now we have to think of lines, of curves in space. So there is um, so uh, a well-known theoretical physicist, Sir Michael Berry, who is based at Bristol. Uh, he studied this problem. Uh, and he was interested 
uh, for some physical reasons in the topology that these nodal lines can exhibit. So he conjectured, so Sir Michael Berry, One. He conjectured that uh, the nodal line, the nodal lines of, uh, of eigenfunctions to the harmonic oscillator, can exhibit uh, arbitrarily complicated topology. So, more precisely, he thought that for any node, now I'll define what a node is, any node or link. <coughs> L in Euclidean space in R3. There exists an eigenfunction an eigenfunction of the quantum harmonic oscillator such that an eigenfunction, let's call it C such that the nodal line, the nodal set, which consists of lines, of this eigenfunction has a union of components, of connected components, components diffeomorphic to L. So, what's a knot? So, as I said, uh, the nodal set is the intersection of the nodal sets of real and imaginary parts, so it's lines. And a knot is a, is a closed curve embedded in, in the Euclidean space. So, simply a knot. A closed curve. Let's say it's smooth which is embedded, so in particular no self-intersections, in Euclidean space. So, uh, of course, a, a simple case is just a circle, unit circle, uh, on the plane uh, set equals zero. For example, it's a particular case of a closed curve in space. Okay. But there are other uh, more complicated ways of having a curve in a space, uh, which forms uh, what is called a knot. Uh, so there are other, other knots which are not of this type. For example, one of the classical ones is the Prefoil knot, something like this. So you see that these two objects are different topologically. They are still closed curves, indeed, but uh, there is no ambient deformation, there is no deformation of the Euclidean space which takes uh, these uh, onto this without having self-intersections. So if you want to deform this uh, object, this curve, so that it becomes this curve, which is called the knot. The knot. During the deformation process, a continuous deformation process, there will be crossings here. This uh, trefoil will cross itself, so that you unknot it. It's like you have a knot, and if you want to to <coughs> to transform it something like this, you have to cross uh, itself. Okay, so. Uh, and uh, there are many other, infinitely many other uh, knots in space, non-equivalent uh, to the trefoil or to the unknot, etc. Infinitely many different knots. And uh, actually, uh, very consider also not a component, a knot. A knot is a single curve. This is uh, connected with a single curve. But uh, you can have several knots uh, disjoint. And so that's a link. A link link is uh, a disjoint union of knots. Okay. 
So you can have uh, a trivial link, say two circles that are unlinked. It's unlinked. These two circles, it's unlinked. But uh, you may have, of course, uh, nodes or circles that are linked. So, for example, the Hof link is one of the classical ones. Okay, this is the Hof link. So you see again, as in the in the case of the of the trefoil, this is two components. So let's say uh, L1 and L2, two circles. And if you want to transform this configuration, these two circles into this one by a motion in a space, a continuous deformation in a space, <coughs> then at some point L1 and L2 will cross. Because you need to separate them. So they will cross to become something like this. So they are uh, non-isotropic. They are topologically they are different, different uh, objects. So what uh, Barry asked is um, the, the question um, refers to the complexity of the nodal lines of uh, how complex, from this viewpoint, can the nodal lines of an eigenfunction of harmonic oscillator be in Euclidean space. So, in particular, if you have any node, any monster of this type, much, much more complicated even than what I draw here, does there exist an eigenfunction of the harmonic oscillator such that if you look at the zero set of this eigenfunction, one of the components is precisely maybe up to the formation this object here, or this uh, hop link, or more complicated uh, nodes or links. So that's uh, Barry's question. Okay. So it turns out that uh, we can answer affirmatively this, uh, this problem. So just as a parenthesis, uh, so recently, uh, physicists uh, are quite interested in uh, in nodes in, in several uh, in several uh, in the creation of nodes in, in lab. So, for example, there are spectacular experiments. So, not only not, not only that the node can appear uh, in, in the solutions to the equation to the PDE, but they really appear in nature in the laboratory. You can measure. You can do pictures with that. So, for example, in fluid mechanics, there are spectacular experiments where you can create a three-point vortex nodes uh, with, water, with water. So there is a group, so it's Irving's group. That's Chicago. Chicago University. Also, in the context of optics, so some people, Mark Dennis' uh, group, Dennis was actually, is actually a former student of uh, Berry, Michael Berry. So they created uh, nodes in light. So this is, uh, so this is nodes in vortex, vortex, vortex nodes, say, eh? vortex nodes. And this is not in light. All of this in lab, in laboratory, real experiments. Not in light. And this is uh, Dennis' group. At risk. And there are other people. Also in uh, this uh, pneumatic uh, liquid crystals uh, that Professor Park explained a few days ago, there are some groups um, who do this kind of things and are interested in these topological complicated objects. So it seems that recently, the last 10, 15 years, there is uh, some interest in, in these structures. Not only that they can appear in the equations of mathematical physics, that they are actually observed uh, in the laboratory. 
at least under some uh, some circumstances. Controlled experiment. So the theorem that we got, we can prove. It's uh, so we can indeed uh, prove that that this conjecture is right. That uh, given any node or link, a finite link, uh, there exists a solution to the quantum harmonic oscillator uh, such that this node appears in this solution. So the theorem is uh, it's a result uh, with Alberto Enciso, David Harley, which is a former postdoc uh, in Madrid. And myself, and it's been published this year in the Journal of the European Mathematical Society. So the theorem is that if you have any link, so let L be a finite link, finite link, to finite I mean finitely many components, finitely many components in the Euclidean space, then for any large enough M, there exists a complex value eigenfunction. function Function with FC of the quantum harmonic oscillator, of course, with eigenvalue two m path plus three. We said that these are the eigenvalues two m plus three. Whose nodal set set? C minus one of zero has a, a subset of components of components diffeomorphic to L. Moreover, these are structurally stable in the sense that I introduced <coughs> a couple of days ago, which are structurally stable. <coughs> so, remember by structurally stable, I mean that if I perturb slightly, if I perturb slightly this function, then the perturb function we will still have a nodal set of uh, this type, if you're more into it. This means structural stability. It's not something which is uh, specific for this function, but it's an open condition. You perturb in the C1 uh, norm, this psi, then uh, the perturb function will still have something, uh, some components in the nodal set which are precisely the not the link. Okay. So this is the theorem. So, indeed, what it says is that there is no structure on the kind of link that you can realize, only we want it to be finite, finitely many components. Then, and it says, it, it says uh, also that there is not only one eigenfunction, there are infinitely many. It says for any large enough n, which more precisely means uh, for any n any n bigger than some n naught, n bigger than some n naught, which will depend on the link that we want to realize. So for any n bigger than some n naught, which exists for each link, then all the uh, well for, for for each one of these uh, eigenvalues, there is an eigenfunction with this property. Okay, so there are infinitely many eigenfunctions with different eigenvalues, high energy, all of them high frequency. Okay. So how 
how can we prove this result? So if there are questions about the, the statement of the problem or the problem, just yes, ask me. Why do you need the same uh, uh, strength before the if n becomes large and you have to It's high oscillatory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Same, same, same eigenfunctions and same liberal work type. Not, not high, the same not high. Yeah, yeah. different eigenvalues, hmm. different okay. eigenfunction, and then, uh, but still the same not type. Right. Same not type. Yeah. yeah. Invariant. Well, it's uh, diffeomorphic. Uh, the, the diffeomorphism changes with, uh, with lambda. Mm -hmm. I, I'll tell you now the idea what exactly the diffeomorphism does. In fact, the diffeomorphism it uh, has to shrink. It's at a small scale. It's not appears at a small scale. So we'll see what I mean. <coughs> but indeed, the diffeo depends on n. On n. Depends on n. On n. Yeah. So, this is the statement. So, how can we prove uh, this? So let's try. Okay, the first question is uh, if we can apply the ideas that uh, I introduced in the previous lectures. Uh, the problem, indeed, you can. Yes. Uh, you can construct a local solution. This time, to construct the local solution, you use uh, Cauchy Kowalski theorem. So you have uh, your knot. Have your not. Let's draw something simple. And uh, you uh, you have to to realize that uh, any knot is the intersection of two uh, of two small cylinders transversely, transverse cylinders, something like this. Okay, this is like uh, so. Let's uh, draw a kind of uh, section. So you have uh, the node, it intersects at this point on this plane. So now uh, a cylinder, a piece of the cylinder could be this, just rotate around it, you have this cylinder, and then the other one could be something like this, for example. Just rotate, it has boundaries, no problem, but it's just intersection of these two small surfaces. Okay, these ribbons, these are called ribbons. Okay. So, uh, you can construct the, the local solution using, two, uh, using Cauchy Kovaleski. So, in each one of these, say sigma 1 and sigma 2, you can define, you can define uh, two different uh, solutions, say, which is, uh, so the harmonic oscillator operates on minus Laplacian plus x squared actinum c1 as real value equal to lambda c1 so this will be and you want c1 and sigma1 to be zero and you want the normal derivative of c1 equal to one normal derivative uh, the normal to sigma1 so it's sigma 1 this, so nu 1. Okay. And, and this has a solution in a neighborhood. Let's say, uh, you can assume, uh, as always, uh, since we, we have the humor physics, you can move things slightly so that they become analytic. No problem. Okay. So this has a solution in some neighborhood of this sigma 1. Okay. And 
the same with sigma 2. So you want, we can put here an i. i, i, then sigma, then ci, or let's put j, because i is the imaginary constant. So j, j, then cj, then sigma j will be 0. And the normal derivative in the j direction is 1. So this gives you two solutions, each one defined on neighborhood on a neighborhood of each sigma j. So it's defined, say here. <coughs> I am drawing something two-dimensional, but just think of then as if this is rotated to get this 2D, but actually it's something, it's a, it's a domain in space. So this gives you <coughs> this, uh, this neighborhood. And this also gives you a solution in this other neighborhood. So you have a solution. The two solutions are defined in a neighborhood of the point. Of the knot, in fact, because well, this is the point that you rotate. So both uh, C1 and C2, you, you can define a, a C as the C1 plus I C2. This is well defined. <coughs> this is a solution, complex value solution. Complex value solution in uh, in a neighborhood in a neighborhood of M. Okay, the intersection of these these two neighborhoods of these two surfaces is defined there. And this is okay. You can do this uh, <coughs> this local construction. Okay. But now you have to globalize this, and then the problems become because uh, uh, you can globalize it, no problem. The green, it's a bit more complicated than the because okay now the Green's function was the Green's function. Okay, it doesn't matter so much. It exists. It exists. So uh, the problem is that there is no obstruction in the globalization. The globalization always exists independently of this lambda, actually. There is a global solution to this. But this global solution is for sure by no means in L2. It's not an eigenfunction in the sense of what we want. It's not in this space. <coughs> so it's a nice exercise. Oh, this is for students. Where are the students? Are you doing my assignment? <laughs> I guess not. Mm, you'll fail the exam. <laughs> so um, let's do, you, you can do something like, um, so yesterday, in the proof of the global approximation theorem, after several steps, we reach uh, an ODE, the radial, well, I didn't write it actually, but... So in this case, the ODE could be something like when you separate the variables, so because um, you can do the same procedure, just follow the procedure of the proof of the global approximation theorem, you have the local solution, you extend by brute force with a G, with a cutoff function, you represent it by a, with a Green's kernel, okay, as the integral. You discretize the integral. You do balayage. This, of course, is an analytic operator. Uh, the, sol the solutions are analytic, or in more generally, they, they, they verify the strong unique continuation. So, at some moment, you can get a solution to this, which is defined on the ball, on some ball. So now you can represent this solution as we did yesterday. Okay, let's separate variables, spherical harmonics. So what's the radial? So the radial will be something like, uh, something like this. Let's write this way. So this comes uh, from the Laplacian, the radial part. There is also a part, let's write it uh, for n equal three. Uh, so you know their, the eigenvalue of the spherical harmonics, L times L plus 1, over the third square, okay, plus, sorry, plus, and uh, a minus the lambda plus their square. For each L, L integer, non-negative. Okay, so solve this. 
that's the Earth effect. See what happens with this uh, OB. You see what's the behavior at infinity of these uh, solutions. So you'll see that this doesn't decay at infinity. This obvious. Okay. So you get some globalizations, but you don't have uh, so this is the exercise. This tra trying to trying to reproduce the same proof as before, you don't get uh, solutions square integral. So, yes, so you have to use a different trick. Yeah? Why is it very Oh, yeah. So you can't uh, <coughs> you can't get uh, solutions with decay. So so the trick is different. The trick is different. The, the point is that this equation this has many solutions uh, globally, of course, not only the solutions of the quantum harmonic. But that's uh, the, this, the, the quantum harmonic oscillator solutions are the good ones for physics because they are in the good space. If not, you have other solutions, of course, but uh, it's not the ones that physicists want. They, they would not be they called uh, uh, good wave functions for the quantum wave functions. They need to be square integral because of this interpretation of probability of the norm of the norm of the function, etc. So you can't uh, do this. So the idea but the idea is to exploit uh, that when n tends to infinity, when the eigenvalue grows, the multiplicity also grows. It grows as n squared, I said. So it's larger and larger. So it's uh, reasonable uh, to think that uh, for large multiplicity, for large eigenvalue, there are so many eigenfunctions that there should be more flexibility, right? So this is expressed uh, in the following. So first an observation and then a lemma. So observation is what happens when you localize an eigenfunction. So let's do, for example, if you do this uh, change of variable, our scaling, square root of lambda times x. So if you write your equation in terms of x tilde in, in, instead of x, you get the Laplacian of x tilde plus 1. There's a 1 here, no? P equals x tilde squared lambda squared p. And this p x tilde, I'm defining as just c x tilde over lambda the square root of lambda. Okay. So, this is just simply a rescaling. We are looking at the equation at these scales. So, when, uh, when x tilde, if, you, if we look at this solution p, x tilde, say in the unit ball of R3, then this means that we are looking at the original solution in a very small ball, in a ball of radius 1 over uh, so c. We are looking at C in the ball of radius 1 over the square root of lambda. Okay? Very, very small scale, which is the natural scale of oscillation of, the, of this, uh, or this frequency, of course. So, when lambda is large, it's reasonable to think that you can uh, drop this term. This could not be if x tilde is in a compact set, say in the unit ball, for example and lambda is large, this is not uh, an important term, and what you get is a solution to the Helmholtz equation. Just which, which just means that the localization of the eigenfunction in balls of this radius, of this radius is controlled by the solutions to the Helmholtz equation. This is always true, not only for the... This is, any, this is a, a general fact uh, for any reasonably well-behaved uh, spectral problem. When you localize, for example, when you study uh, on Riemannian manifolds, you have metric, but if you localize in the small regions, 
the, flex, the metric will become flat, and you always get that everything locally is controlled by Henkel's equation. So the point, so this is not a, a deep uh, observation, it's something that happens in a, in a broad uh, generality. So the thing is that here, for the harmonic oscillator, the converse is true. This means that for any solution to the Hempel equation in R3, any solution to the Hempel equation in R3, there exists a solution to the quantum harmonic oscillator, uh, an eigenfunction, such that when you localize it, it is very close to this Hempel solution, the converse. So this is the lemma, and, and with this I finish uh, this part because if not, I don't have time to, to tell you about uh, Alain Kahn. And, so the lemma, which is, uh, we call it, uh, say, uh, inverse localization. Is the following. So we have, uh, so given any let V be and the unit parity, because you, the solutions of the harmonic oscillator are even or odd, depending on the number, so this is actually transmitted into the localization. But apart from this uh, easy abstraction, let V be an even or odd, or odd solution. Of uh, the Hempel equation. No, of course, by this I mean v of x is equal to v minus x, uh, plus or minus, depending if it's even or odd. So, solution of this uh, of the Hempel equation in R3. Anyone. The only requirement is this uh, symmetry. Okay. Now, fix epsilon. Epsilon and an integer n. Okay. Then, for any large enough, large enough eigenvalue of lambda. There is an eigenfunction an eigenfunction of C of the quantum harmonic oscillator such that the following estimate holds. When you localize the eigenfunction, <coughs> it will be close to B. C square root lambda minus C. You compute the difference and you compute the CFO, say on the unit ball. Then it is smaller than epsilon. This is the theory. That uh, there, there is always, apart from this uh, abstraction on that you need uh, to be even or odd, you can always uh, reproduce. You can always reproduce the behavior of a solution to the Hempel equation with a high energy, with a high energy eigenfunction in uh, in balls. So in 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 the localization in in balls of radius one over a square root of lambda. That's the that's the point. And that's the lemma, the, the key lemma to, to prove uh, the theory. Okay. Here, this, uh, this norm, these derivatives, we take these derivatives with respect to this value. That's why I write a dot e, e x, e x, and uh, okay. So, this is, uh, and then the diffeomorphism is essentially a shrinking. Of the <coughs> so it depends on, on lambda because it's a shrinking uh, of uh, a it's a scaling of uh, one over a square root of lambda. So it depends on lambda. You, when you have a large, uh, if, if 
the eigenvalue is very, very large, then you have to shrink uh, more. But uh, it's still diffeomorphic to the to the node that you want, but it's very localized. It's very small. The node is very small. Okay. And this is the lemma. There is no time to prove uh, this. But um, it makes use of, it's quite a specific uh, for the harmonic oscillator. It's something similar is true also for the other uh, important potential in physics, which is the hydrogen atom. So just as a remark, you have the hydrogen atom, which is the potential minus 1 over R, the Kepler potential. Then you also have something similar to this. Is different. The values are different. They don't tend to infinity. They tend to zero, actually, negative spectrum. But you have uh, some similar kind of localization, inverse uh, localization. And uh, we don't know how to prove such a kind of inverse localization for any radial potential, for example. You need some algebra. You, you use in the proof, you use an algebraic tricks which are very specific uh, for these uh, potentials because you have, a, uh, you have a, an additional degeneracy of the spectrum, very degenerate spectrum. It's, uh, this is in classical mechanics, this is uh, represented or this is called the super integrability. They, they are not only integrable potentials, but they have more per integral, more conserved quantities. So this is uh, transmitted the spectrum is very degenerate. The spectrum depends just on one quantum number, and uh, you use uh, these properties. Okay. So, so we don't know if, if this is true, or at least we can't prove it uh, for general uh, radial potential. For example, for quartic potential. Even you have some degeneracy there, but it's not as degenerate. So this is um, so. Of course, when you combine this uh, with the theorem for the Helmholtz equation, you prove uh, the theorem I stated. Because what you do is uh, okay. Let's construct a solution to the to the Helmholtz equation. Complex value solution to the Helmholtz equation, which has. Uh, this uh, nodal set, this uh, node, and this can be done now with the techniques uh, before. The local solution is constructed, as I explained before, with the Chico Valensky, uh, but, but now it's, uh, it's directly, there is no x square, it's simply the Helmholtz equation, it's as before. But uh, since we are interested in intersections, this I didn't explain in the previous lecture because uh, I only explained uh, the nodal set of a single function. But if you want to do intersections of functions, you can use cauchy kowalewski in this way. You can globalize with the Runge theorem for the Helmholtz equation. It doesn't matter if it decays at infinity or not, because at the end of the day, we look at these solutions, at this solution only on the unit ball. It doesn't matter what happens away from it. It's not important. And uh, so then, uh, with this localization, inverse localization, we, we know that there exists an eigenfunction for large enough frequency, which is close to this one. And by Tom's theorem, and now again you apply Tom's theorem, the structural stability of this node, the nodal set of this, you get that C, when it is localized, has this nodal set. But by the structural stability, you use Tom. Okay. Applied to this. That's why I, I chose uh, say one and one here in this. So to have the, the two gradients on the two the, the two surfaces sigma one and sigma two uh, intersect transversely. So the gradients are transverse. So the rank condition in Tom, if you go back to the to lecture two, the beginning of lecture two, there was a rank condition. The rank must be maximal. Now you have two functions. Maximal means uh, that the rank is 2. So, indeed, you have rank 2. You have the two independent gradients at each point. Okay, so you, have, you can apply it. 
and this, uh, and this uh, would prove uh, the theory without detail. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, I want to tell you something a bit about other uh, economics. So, if there are some questions about Berry or these knots, if not, uh, we will go to the next step. Can you explain why the mountain can be chosen as arbitrary as long as it's peak? Right, right. It means that the higher unemployment is behind the similar structures and the bike scaling. Right, yes, bike scaling. Yes, yes. Not any, this is just existence of, uh, I mean, it's not. Um, the conjecture, or the, what one would like to prove, is that uh, for a typical high energy function, typical in some sense, you have to uh, introduce some uh, probability measure. For a typical function, if you observe at some point, you have this complexity. So you, you can have, uh, for any node, that you, any node is realized in a typical function. When lambda rose, not only uh, because this is uh, a realization, this around the zero is at the origin, very close to the origin, it's very small, and it's just the existence of an of an eigenfunction. It's open the condition, as I said, there is a small group, but uh, one expects that uh, for a very large <coughs> subset of the eigenfunctions, uh, for a fixed energy, large energy, you have also this, but that's that's more complicated. You can do this for if you study eigenfunctions on the sphere, on the sphere, uh, say three dimensional sphere, uh, then again the spectrum is well known, but very complex. Who is the student? The subject is very So uh, on the three sphere, uh, you have spherical harmonics, you have the eigenfunctions. The spectrum is well known, this is, I wrote there. Uh, for spherical harmonics, uh, and then uh, the, the multiplicity is also large, it grows with the value. Then you can prove, uh, using other machinery, that for a random, typical, or almost surely, for a typical random eigenfunction, random introducing a Gaussian measure, the Gaussian measure you'll have uh, an nodal set which is uh, of a uh, given knot type for high energy random eigenfunction. Typical random dragon function, you fix L, a node. So then, if the, la if the energy is bigger than some lambda node, then a typical random eigenfunction function uh, will contain this kind. It's more than this. But, uh, these theorems or these techniques don't apply to the, to the harmonic oscillator at this moment. Okay. So this is uh, this concerns. Uh, this eigenvalue problem. And it only applies to the speed, right? not even to the code. It should exist there, but there are some differences which come from number theory. Maybe I'll tell you something about the tools in, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes. Or, but in 30 minutes, I have to finish all the stuff. <laughs> okay, let, let's tell you a bit about a Lenkan equation. So, so the Alekan equation so this is uh, this nonlinear PDE, Laplacian of U plus U with this cubic term equal to zero, and uh, I will study this in Euclidean space. Okay. So this is, uh, and usually people are interested in bounded solutions. Bounded solutions. So I'll consider also uh, bounded solutions. So this PDE appears, for example, in, uh, in the Georgius, famous the Georgius conjecture. If you have, uh, the conjecture is, if you have bounded solutions, 
to this equation and some extra conditions say that it's, uh, the solution is monotonous in some direction. Let's say u derivative, the partial derivative of u with respect to x1 positive, then in some dimensions at least, this uh, should imply that the solution depends on one variable. That's one variable. And, uh, and um, oh, one variable which is, uh, which is a linear polynomial. So the, the level sets should be uh, affine planes. Okay, this is not proof in full generality, it's proved uh, for some dimensions, uh, as stated originally by the Georgi, and this proof in, uh, in higher dimensions, but instead of this condition, some condition of stability, so because it's a critical point of some functional, so if it's stable, or if the, the index is zero, then you can prove some things, and there are counterexamples, but well, there is a lot of literature on, on, this, uh, on this equation. So here, what I want to analyze is that uh, without this condition, if you don't have this, and, uh, and even uh, if you look at this as, as it is uh, as, a, as a critical point of some functional, then uh, if you don't consider that the index of this critical point is finite, okay, then you can construct the solutions to a length and with complicated topology, with compact level sets of complicated topology. Our solutions will not satisfy this monotonicity condition, and if you compute even the, the index, in some sense, the index of this critical point solution is not finite index. So the theorem Here, uh, that we proved with Alberto Piso. last year, 96 MPD last year, it's the following. So it's like, uh, so it's the same statement as for the nodal set of Hempel, but uh, the claim is that it holds also for solutions to the Alenka equation. So, so let sigma be a compact, a compact hypersurface, hypersurface of Rn. Now I want, I have actually to restrict to a bigger than 3. Uh, if we analyze this problem in, uh, in three dimension, uh, the claim that I'm going to write here, here now is, uh, well, I don't know if it's false, but we can prove it. We, we, can, we can prove something uh, similar, but not in, in a different space, but, uh, but not as I'm going to state. So here n is bigger or equal than 4. Then there exists, then there exists, a solution U of the Lincoln equation in Rn and which falls off at infinity at infinity in the same way as the handful solutions that we constructed. So this is, this is 
statement is uh, oh, you can realize here I just focus uh, say compact hypersurface to connect it. Uh, you can realize also many connected components at the same time if they are unlinked, as we did yesterday in the in the statement of the theory of the analogous theory for Hempworth equation. I required the components to be unlinked, so here it, it would hold, or it holds also. You have several components and they are unlinked. Okay, and uh, you have this uh, this decay activity, the same as for the So again, uh, as in the case of uh, Barry, of the problem with the quantum harmonic oscillator, you cannot apply directly the, the strategy that I presented because in the second lecture, not because of the local solution, but because of uh, the global approximation theorem. In the proof of the global approximation theorem, this key uh, has a linear equation. So, so the proof, just idea, an idea, is just that we are going to uh, consider uh, solutions that are perturbations of solutions to the Hanford equation, small solutions of the Hanford equation. So it's like. Uh, so there is a trivial solution of this, which is zero, zero, one. Mm -hmm. So the linearization at zero is the, is the Hempworth equation. So I'm going to perturbate from the small solutions to the Hempworth equation. So for this, uh, we will introduce, so we introduce an iterative scheme, which is a standard actually. Mm -hmm. So and for this, it's quite convenient to write this equation in an equivalent way, uh, which is uh, as an integral equation. And it's, uh, it's by the way, uh, not very far from uh, what uh, Sam explained uh, yesterday for the liebmann schwinger equation, that you have Green's function and you can write uh, your solution here. I'm going to, to put uh, a delta omega. This delta will be a small constant. And this omega will be a thankful solution. And so, solution, and here, plus the convolution of, of G. G is our old friend uh, from previous uh, lectures, the Green's function of the, for the Laplace and Planck plus one, a Green's function, Green's function. Okay, remember, for example, that an n equal to which is not the case because I am in higher dimension, but just to have a, a, a specific formula in mind. This G, the Green's function with Paul at the origin, was nothing else than something like this. Okay? And for a general N, uh, you have a formula involving Bessel uh, uh, functions of second kind and these things. So, of course, Of course, when you apply Laplacian plus one to you here, then this will disappear because it's a solution to Hempel, and you get U cube cube. So indeed, if you if you are able to solve this uh, problem in the appropriate space, then you will get indeed a solution to the Alenkan equation. This is what we want. Okay, and for this we have to take. Delta is small. So, with this, based on this uh, idea, we simply propose the following scheme. Just an iteration, which is uh, a way of finding uh, a fixed point of the operator. So, let's start with. Uh, so, our initial point in the iteration is the solution to the Hempel equation, the small solution. Delta omega, this is the initial point of the iteration. And now, at each step, the uj plus 1 will be computed as delta w plus the convolution 
with uh, the cubic, the cube of the of the previous term in the iteration. And for this to make sense, I want this handful solution to decay itself, so that this integral makes sense. So this uh, this omega again will be a handful solution. Solution which decays uh, in as x to 1 minus m over 2. Okay. So, with this, uh, with this procedure, what, what we prove is that we prove the convergence of this uh, scheme. Okay, in the appropriate space, the space uh, which is convenient uh, for, for this dimension here, for the convergence in this space, you need n bigger or equal than form. You have uh, you introduce the following weighted space. As I call it, C k c minus one over two R n. Okay. And it's simply it's a space endowed with this. Endowed with this norm, which is just uh, a CK norm, but uh, with, uh, with this natural wave. This is our natural space in this context. So it's like a CK norm, but we put here this object because we want uh, the decay, the, the good decay of this solution. And then, when when n is equal is bigger than three, you can prove convergence in this space. Okay, delta is small. We have convergence. Convergence in this CK n minus 1 over of R. Okay, and for this you need some estimates and this convolution operator, etc. There is no, no time for this. So I want to tell you in the last 15 minutes about the torus, the flat torus. But uh, this is the main idea. And of course, uh, when you have the convergence of this, you get. U j converges to some u in this, this space, this norm. So you get uh, that u, of course, satisfies the Lincoln equation. Okay? And you can compare, if you compare u u with delta omega, say in this space, for example, or even if you want in CK norm, but just uh, thinking just fixing uh, compact set, serving ball, this will be a small. Okay. It's quite a small. Actually, it's better to do this comparison, divide by delta here, so that you have something that doesn't depend on the parameter, the omega, and then you have something that is very small. You get this in the in the scheme itself, because you can bound all these terms that appear. So, with this, what you get is that, okay, now, now how you prove uh, this theorem? Okay, so it's simply, first, invoke the theorem for the handful equation. So you will choose an omega, you will choose an omega, which is a solution to the handful equation, in the theorem indicate in this, uh, this way, it's in this, this, this finite, this, this, in this space, and which has uh, a nodal set, a component of the nodal set, which is diffeomorphic to sigma. This comes from the theorem in lecture 3. Now, you put this omega as the initial with a delta. You need a small, you need to be a small because you are uh, perturbing from the zero, actually, in the Lincoln equation. Uh, you put this as the initial point in your iteration proce procedure. You iterate, you have proof convergence. For the, the convergence has nothing to do with the fact that this omega has a nodal set of whatever, it's a general 
property for an omega which is in this space. Okay. You get something that you get convergence to some view, which is a solution to Alenka. And such that if you compare u over delta with the omega, this is too small, as small as you want. So you get that u over delta, since uh, the zero set of this omega was structurally stable, again Tom theorem, you get that this zero set is again equal to sigma. But of course the zero set of u over delta and of u is the same, it's just a constant, difference in the constant. So this is how you prove uh, the, the theorem. Okay, so yes. U over delta equals zero. You get the zeros of u, and that's the that's the proof. It's convenient to to put the delta here, so that nothing depends on delta here. So that the structural stability, now the structural stability, would depend on delta itself. But uh, if you don't put the delta here, then the then the, the radius of uh, structural stability will not depend on delta. And that's all. that's all. So with this you prove, uh, and you can do this uh, procedure for other uh, non-linear PDEs. The one which is uh, successful also is um, minimal graph. Minimal graph is uh, so it's divergence. So equation is divergence gradient of u one plus gradient u squared equals zero, minimal graph. So, uh, so the surface, so the surface in R m plus one, given by x m plus one equal to u, equal to u. This is minimal. So you can do exactly the same here, but now your model equation will not be uh, uh, will not be Hempel. Because here the linearization around the zero will be the Laplace, the Laplace equation. Here you you perturb from Laplacian of u equals zero. Harmonic functions. Okay. So with harmonic functions you don't have any kind of decay. You cannot do this globally, but you can do this uh, say on disk or on balls. So you can prescribe uh, pieces of of minimal graph. Mainly, the, you, you can prescribe essentially up to perturbation this part here. So, for example, intersections. <coughs> it, it would be a, a graph very close to the to the flat graph. It's flat. It's almost zero. You put always you put always a delta every day because you you, you are emerging from the zero solution. <laughs> so it's a, a, a minimal graph, which is uh, very uh, which is uh, small, but it's uh, but you can prescribe, for example intersection with the with the horizontal plane, this kind of things. It can it would intersect in complicated objects. Okay. It's small but it intersects in, but it's oscillates. It intersects. So you can do this same kind of process. So it's okay if, if there are no questions now I want to Sorry, I cannot give uh, more details now, but uh, I want to just to show you some of the applications. And especially, I want now to spend the last minutes uh, on the torus, because it's uh, the, the procedure that we use to understand eigenfunctions on the torus. It's very simple, and, uh, and but uh, it involves some property, some number theoretic property that. Uh, Make it, makes it difficult to generalize, for example. You okay. But of course, uh, at the end of the lecture, you can ask me if you want you know, more details or to discuss something. No problem. And I, I ask the students uh, about the exercise itself. <laughs> you have to know my exercise. <laughs> okay, so the, the final comments that I want to make is about uh, nodal sets. Uh, nodal 
several sets uh, of eigenfunctions. Lattices, which are not as simple as this, uh, then uh, it's not so clear that is true what I'm going to tell you. You can consider other lattices instead of this, this uh, homogeneous lattice. Oh, here I forgot uh, in the statement I, I said n bigger or equal than 4. You, if you indeed do the proof, the estimates, you see that you use this to be in this space, if not. Uh, you don't guarantee that certain operator, uh, uh, the range of certain operator is in this space. But uh, for any, if you want, so there's an analogous statement. In this case, right now, this, you, you use a different space. Okay, you, you use uh, the space here itself. Okay, you have to do things in a different way. You can prove that the solutions that you get are bounded, still, not only in that. In, Therefore, they are bounded because they are solutions, but they can. But uh, you can ensure that they decay. You can ensure that they decay. Although you start with a solution of Hempel which decays. In, in, in R3, the solution of the decay of Hempel is this. So this is, of course, here. But, um, but you, you cannot do this. Uh, you cannot work in this space. You don't get the good estimates. You, you need to, to consider a, another space. Right? And here you prove convergence of the iterative schemes. And being an elliptic PDE by regularity, the object, the functions that you get are smooth. So, okay. so then we want to analyze um, the nodal sets uh, of eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. Uh, on compact uh, manifolds. Because uh, up to now, uh, we have considered the Hempel equation, the somehow equation of eigenfunctions on the Euclidean space. Okay. Eigenfunctions in some sense, they are not square iterable, but in some sense. But um, if you want to analyze, and, and these uh, techniques uh, work for Hempel equation on any non compact manifold, as I said, no problem. You can prescribe to that set these kind of things in any non compact manifolds, no one limit. Okay, because global approximation theory works, you can prove it. Uh, but if you go to compact manifolds, if you want to prove uh, analogous statements for compact manifolds, there is a big issue, which is uh, the global approximation theorem uh, doesn't work and cannot work, actually. Right? You, you have. Um, so in general, so if you consider yes, minus. if you consider eigenvalue problem on a compact manifold, compact, no boundary, let's think of no boundary, although you can of course it is the same problem uh, with boundary condition, dirig led for example, but okay, let's think as a boundary less manifold, compact, no boundary. Then, uh, this lambda we know it for these solutions to be non-trivial, uh, uh, it belongs to a discrete set, infinite but discrete. So the spectrum is discrete. Spectrum. discrete. So, but uh, this is globally, but locally, Locally, there is no abstraction on lambda, of course. The solution, the equation minus Laplacian u equal lambda u always has solution. For any lambda. Okay. So, this means that necessarily, at least for the lambdas which are not in the spectrum of this, you cannot globalize this. Uh, these eigenfunctions, they, they cannot be so global, they cannot be approximated by global solutions because the lambda uh, is restricted. Okay. 
So, so it's not only a matter that uh, you cannot prove the global approximation theorem. It, it cannot be true. Even, even when you fix lambda uh, to be eigenvalue, exactly, there is, of course, uh, much more local freedom than global. So, so how can we proceed in the case of uh, compact? So, in, in general, it's a quite a wide open problem. So, it may happen. So, I, I'm going to state a theorem saying that on the torus, on the flat torus, uh, you can indeed have some flexibility. And the reason is, uh, it's analogous or, or very similar to the reason for the, for the quantum harmonic oscillator. For high energy eigenfunctions, high lambda eigenfunctions, you have large multiplicity. And this large multiplicity, will, uh, this gives you a, a basis of functions uh, which uh, permits you to, uh, to uh, create complicated nodal sets of large energy. But for this, you need uh, uh, a high multiplicity, large multiplicity. Right? And not only that, uh, in the proof, uh, you use some algebraic uh, tricks that uh, it is not a matter that if you have any any compact manifold whose spectrum is degenerate, then you can do these things. No, we can do these things. Uh, uh, now we can do on the torus, we can do also on the sphere, we can do some on, on quotients of the sphere, less spaces, but uh, not in other manifolds, which may be degenerate also, but uh, this we don't know. And for example, it could happen that, uh, because it's known that a generic manifold, generic metric, so fix, uh, you fix uh, the topology, you fix n, here for a generic metric, the spectrum, generic, uh, means a tensor, uh, yes, tensor, say in CK, no, no open, yes. Then the spectrum is, uh, spectrum is non-degenerate. For generic metric, for generic metric, you have no degeneracy. Eigenvalues are simple, generic, generic. Tends to move the metric, can move slightly the metric. Uh, even uh, this is true even uh, in the conformal class. Even in the same conformal class. So. Uh, with this, this says uh, that uh, generically you don't have the degeneracy. The eigenvalues are simple, so the situation is even uh, more complicated. If you don't have uh, the degeneracy, if your eigenvalues uh, are simple, all of them, you, when you fix the eigenvalue, you have one eigenfunction only, up to the constant factor, only one. So uh, then, uh, no idea at all how to deal with just one function. Because if you have many, it's reasonable that you can superpose these many, <laughs> take linear combinations, so you get uh, complicated things. But only with one for each lambda, it's uh, more dramatic even the, the situation. Although it may be true, it may be true that given any topology sigma, uh, there exists uh, some high lambda, or there exists uh, infinitely many high lambda which realize this topology. This, there are no Complex examples to this, and probably people believe that it might be true because eigenfunctions, when uh, when lambda grows, they oscillate quite a lot. They create a lot of nodal sets, a lot of critical points. That's in fact one of the famous Gauss conjecture. Uh, so probably uh, there are many complicated topologies, but uh, it's difficult to analyze. So the only thing that we can prove at this moment is the following theorem for the torus. As I, I said also for the sphere, but I'm not the state of theorem for the sphere here. And it's again, um, it's again an inverse localization. It's more or less a similar statement to the, to the theorem for the quantum harmonic oscillator. So we have a lemma. So again, of course, it's the same as for the quantum harmonic oscillator. When you rescale with the square root of lambda, 
you get the Henkorth equation with a 1. Okay, that's uh, it's the natural uh, the scale. The 1 over the square root of lambda is the natural scale of oscillation of, uh, of an eigenfunction with this eigenvalue. So, what this lemma says is that uh, given any, eigen, any solution to Henkorth, there exists a high energy eigenfunction of the torus such that if you localize it at some point, the point is not important actually, then uh, they are close to each other. So let me be a solution. Now there is no restriction on, on evenness or oddness of the, any solution of the handful. Euclidean space. Now we fix uh, positive epsilon, an integer m. And the constant, the positive constant. Okay. Any ones you want. Then there exist infinitely many. Large enough eigenvalues. And that's the eigenvalues, I didn't say it, but the eigenvalues for the torus, they are simply this form, k squared, for k uh, integer, uh, integer point. So there is infinitely many large enough lambdas with a corresponding eigenfunction. Satisfying the estimate, satisfying something similar to what I wrote for the harmonic quantum harmonic oscillator, if you localize with the square root of lambda, and you measure this difference in the CM norm, okay, this is smaller than epsilon. Okay, so this, this is this localization. And so, two differences with the previous theorem. I'm finishing now. One is any solution. Now there is no, because the, there is no, it, for the quantum harmonic oscillator, you need even or odd because you have parity. For the, the quantum harmonic oscillator eigenfunctions, you have the x squared potential, so you have some parity in the solutions. But here, not. So, any, any solution. Then, for any solution, now I don't claim that given all, uh, that uh, there exists a lambda naught such that for all lambda bigger than lambda naught this holds. This is not true. Well, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, we cannot prove it. We only can prove that there is a sequence of eigenvalues tending to infinity for which this holds. This doesn't mean that all eigenvalues that you can construct an eigenfunction for all high enough eigenvalues. Okay, if there exists infinity. And finally, just um, an idea. So the idea is simply using um, this Herbert's representation that we discussed yesterday. We said that your function B, you can uh, do in some things, you, you can write it this way. As, uh, so the Fourier, the Fourier transform is uh, is a distribution which is supported on the n minus one dimensional sphere, and actually, uh, with thanks to the decay, to the good decay of these um, these solutions, uh, this f is uh, is in L two. Actually, you can even assume that this is smooth, doing some things, the perturbations, and. And this is in this is in Euclidean space. This is your representation of your v in Euclidean space. You can always represent your v for any v. There exists something like this which approximates v in the in the world. 
not any b is of this type, but on the ball, you can assume that it's almost of this type. So then the, the trick will be similar to before. You have to discretize have to discretize uh, the sphere, you have to approximate the Lebesgue measure on the sphere by, uh, well, with this F actually, which is an absolutely continuous, a good measure here. Well, not actually measure, it's signed, it's signed. As we said, we have signed, okay, it's a complex. By deltas, uniform distribution. So you, you discretize by points. And if you choose the points in the good way, points for which uh, there exists some, some integer such that when you multiply the integer by the point you get that this is in the lattice, in the, in the set, it's an integer. So if you discretize by rational points, rational points, then rational points have a common denominator, a lambda big enough, such that you can approximate this by a sum with the exponentials that will be, so it's uh, i psi j dot x, some with some constants here, and this will be rational points on the sphere, rational points. So there will exist a big lambda such that this is an integer. So defining a function with this lambda is a function on the torus, this periodic. Not like this. Here is not periodic because you have denominators. You have denominators, but you take the greater denominator and you multiply. You define another function, which will be your u, which will be exactly this, but with the, something like this. This capital lambda psi j x. Now this lives on the torus because this is an integer. Okay, an integer. So now this lives on the torus and this gives you the, the good, uh, when you rescale, when you go back, this lambda will be, lambda <coughs> square will be actually the eigenvalue and when you do this, you get uh, the approximation that you want. It's simply uh, that you are rescaling the, uh, you, you discretize the points and, and you get a function that is already defined for the torus. And, okay. Time is over, so I hope you enjoy uh, the lectures. I'm around, so you can ask me. So thank you very much for your attention.